Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Mornings in the village always start early. Mrs. Nelly woke up, let the hens out for a walk, fed the few remaining rabbits, and swept the yard. She looked sadly at the dilapidated barn with its leaky roof and the abandoned outbuilding and the crooked fence, and sighed heavily. Her neighbor's cat Ricky was already there, rubbing at her feet, demanding her breakfast. She petted him gently and poured some milk into a bowl. It was the turn of the dog Boo Boo. The old woman poured yesterday's soup and water into her bowl and scratched her behind the ear. The dog was already very old, blind, honestly served all her life in this house and adored her mistress. Boo Boo felt the warmth of her hand, immediately wagged her tail, and began to jump for joy. The old woman began to talk to her habitually in the morning. Oh, Boo Boo, you and I are the only ones left to live. There is no one else. The master has been lying in the damp ground for a long time. Molly, my daughter, is there too. Only my grandson Alex is left. But he's silly, and he'll never come here. He doesn't need us. The house and yard's gone to ruin without Todd. No man's hands for so many years. That's fate, the fiend. Oh my God. Easter is coming and I must go to the cemetery today to look after the graves, or it would be a shame to leave my family unattended on a holiday like this. Boo Boo, I'm going to look for paint in the barn. I think there was a blue one. And you eat, my dear, while the soup is warm. I warmed it especially for you. Mrs. Nellie found everything she needed, got ready, and went to the cemetery to put her loved one's graves in order. Her husband and daughter were buried very close to each other, though they died at different times. Yes, it was half a day's work. I have to shovel out last year's leaves, sweep everything up, and paint the fences, because the paint has faded in two years. Mrs. Nellie looked at the portrait of her beloved daughter, could not stand it, and cried bitterly again, wiping her tears with the edge of her chintz handkerchief. Seven years had passed, and the wound in her heart was still not healing. Mrs. Nellie gazed at her native features, the dimples on her cheeks, the beautiful brown eyes, and such a warm, open smile, and memories came flooding back to her. Then she shifted her gaze to Todd's photo. It was an old one, but he was looking at her just as he had when he was alive, sternly but lovingly. My darlings, my darlings, how I miss you. How my heart aches and aches. I wish I could hold you now, Molly. Stroke your thick, silky hair. Have a heart-to-heart -heart talk like before. And there's no you, because you've been robbed of your life by the damned bastard my own. The elderly woman began to clean the graves with particular enthusiasm, trying to numb the soul wound she had stirred up again in this way, while she herself went over her life in her mind. Nellie married according to village customs, the neighbor's son, Todd, who had returned from the army to work as a tractor driver, was attracted to a very young Nellie. She had a long blonde braid and a prominent shape, and she was very shy and timid, and blushed at every compliment. The boy did not think long, consulted with his relatives, and married her off properly. Nellie's mother was happy, because Todd was a guy from a good family, not a drinker, and so she married off her daughter. Except no one ever asked Nellie if she wanted it or not. The poor bride was worried and cried secretly, because she did not know her future husband at all. We met a couple of times at a dance and that was all. And apparently he was ugly. Shorter than her, with large, spade-like hands, and a round nose like a potato. At first, family life was far from sugar, lived with her husband's parents, and they were always lecturing and nagging their daughter-in-law. Nellie did not dare to cross her, she listened, but it irritated her terribly. The young husband saw and understood everything, felt pity for his wife, and decided to change everything. It is not good when parents interfere in the life of the newlyweds, there is no room of their own. He bought the right materials and got himself a plot of land from the village council. Todd built his own house, and Nellie helped him with everything, even serving bricks, because she really wanted to get away from her mother-in-law, so they began to live separately. Not at once, but gradually she came to appreciate all the virtues of her husband, 
and she fell in love with him deeply and permanently. Todd turned out to be an excellent host, thrifty, he had golden hands. He built the bathhouse, the outhouse, the gazebo himself, all with such diligence and zeal. And when Molly was born, the man was perfectly happy. He was terribly proud of his model family. Nellie tried to keep up with her husband, too, and worked. They kept the farm and the vegetable garden, and the woman worked as a milkmaid on the farm, but no matter how early she got up, she would not rest until she had done all the work. Todd often went into town to buy tractor parts or to the market, and sometimes he took his daughter with him. It was always such a holiday for Molly, such an event. Her mother would dress her up beautifully, tie huge white bows, and she would just have time to turn her head, look at the high rises, the squares, the expensive cars, and life in the capital. Living in the capital became a cherished dream of a girl. It seemed to her that only here she could become a person and find her happiness. Nellie pitied her daughter and did not make her plow in the garden or on the farm, and Molly did not show any particular zeal. The daughter grew up very pretty. As soon as she had finished school, she fled from her parents' nest to the capital to study nursing. The daughter even graduated from college with honors. She liked her chosen profession, got a job in a hospital, rented a room in a dormitory. She often visited her parents and did not forget them. She tried to bring her mother any gift. They sat long evenings in the gazebo and chatted heart to heart. One day, the daughter came so excited, just all glowing and began to tell, Mammy, I met with such a guy, a rich man, the son of a businessman, a handsome man, and what a car he had, you should have seen it. He took me for a ride, with the sunroof open, it took my breath away. His name is Max. Nellie looked at her daughter strangely and asked, Where did you meet such a rich guy, I wonder? And what, have you already had everything? Forgive me for asking so directly. I'm just afraid for you. That's not how it used to be with us. Molly blushed, but she didn't hide it from her mother. Come on, mum. All we did was kiss. I like Max so much, I must be in love. My heart just jumped out of my chest, and so good inside. Do you have the same with my dad? The woman sighed softly. No, my daughter. With my daddy, everything was different. When I married, I almost did not know him. My parents engaged me. And that's all. Nobody asked my wishes. But then, when we started living together, working, doing everything together, I fell in love with your father because he is the real owner, the head of the family. The girl was surprised. What a horror. It is long and boring. And what if he turned out to be bad? Then what? Or could you not love him? I think you have to love him and then marry him. So that, like in the movies, the head would spin and the ground would go out from under your feet. That's how I am, mom. So I'm really lucky to have Max. Yes, and I don't have to work like a horse, because my fiancé is rich, he has a lot of money, and even more. It turns out that we are a perfect couple. Nellie took her daughter in her arms and pressed her to herself. God willing, Molly, that it be so. I wish you nothing but happiness, but I'm afraid for you. Usually rich people marry rich people. What if your Max doesn't marry you? He'll just fool around, that's all. Has he introduced you to your parents? They don't mind your relationship, Molly laughed. Mom, come on, who does that nowadays? We'll decide for ourselves whether we live together or not. It has nothing to do with parents. Max loves me, he whispers to me. He won't betray me because I trust him. By the way, I didn't tell you how we met. And the daughter enthusiastically shared with her mother's innermost, and the woman was so worried. She thought to herself, that's the daughter grew up fell in love. So it should be. How will her fate? What lies ahead? I hope the guy really turns out to be good. So I want my daughter to be happy and know no trouble. And aloud said, you know what? You invite him to visit us, come together. If he loves me, he won't refuse. I'll set a generous table. We'll get acquainted. We'll look at your max. We have a beautiful place. 
a river, a forest, and nature. You can go for a walk. Molly only snorted. Well, mummy, Max won't want to go to the country for sure. He's only seen animals in the zoo. And the smell of manure will make him faint. Then he'll leave me for sure. Come on, let's go to bed. Four months later, my daughter called me in tears and sobbed into the phone. Mommy, you were right about everything. Max is a bastard and a bastard. He left me, his parents. It turns out, has long been a rich bride watched. And he, the scoundrel, on two fronts met with me and with her. And when he found out that I was pregnant, so at the same moment said that it is not known whose child and disappeared. And in general, it turns out, a simple village nurse is not his equal. Mom, I'm so scared. Maybe I should have an abortion. The term is still small. Who would want me alone with a baby? Nellie's heart shrank, and it was hard to breathe. She took in more air and as calmly as possible said, You do not get hot, and do not cry, honey. Come on, we'll talk. We will not scold you and your father. I will prepare him. Do not need an abortion, honey. Do not ruin the baby's life and your health. I beg you. We can do it together. We will help you. I am waiting for you. The husband found out about his daughter's pregnancy and that her fiancé left her. He turned white and clenched his fists. What a brute. What a bastard. And Molly's a good girl. You should have whipped her when she was a child, not spoiled, and pampered her. What shall we do now? She's disgraced her daughter in the whole village. Maybe we should find this fiancé and explain to him man to man that this is not the way to do it. It's not manly. He knocked up a girl and went into the bushes. Or else he won't even pay alimony. And he won't even acknowledge the child. Nellie suddenly burst into tears and told her husband in a fit of rage. Why are you doing this, Toddy? Molly's having a hard time as it is. Crying, crying. Don't you dare yell at her when she gets here and don't accuse her of anything. Our girl fell in love. She couldn't help it. She was tempted. She believed her fiancé. She's already been talking about an abortion. I'll beg her not to take the sin. And don't you dare look for that scoundrel. Don't get involved. God is his judge. Never mind, we'll raise a grandson. If that's his fate. Todd calmed down a little, hugged his wife. Well, I'm sorry, Nellie. I was just shouting out of emotion. You don't have to shake your fists after a fight, do you? Let people talk. We'll get over it. The main thing is to calm down my daughter, so she will not make mistakes, and then she will not forgive herself. I promise I won't scold her or reproach her. Let her come. And so their family had a baby boy, and they named their grandson Alex. Molly continued to live in the capital. She flatly refused to move to the village. It was hard for her, of course, with her son alone. But nothing. She somehow braced herself, coped. Todd and Nellie tried to help her as much as they could with the money. And they took everything fresh from the garden, vitamins. They took her to their house for the summer when she was little. Nellie loved Alex very much, tried to spoil him, bought him all the tastiest things. But she and Todd began to notice that their grandson was stealing money from their wallet. And there's only one store in the village, so the clerk figured it out. Todd got angry and started scolding his grandson. What are you doing, Alex? You son of a bitch. We never had thieves in our family. Why did you steal grandma's money? Don't you have enough? If you told us, we'd have given it to you. I'll take a belt and give you a good thrashing, so you'll know. They used to whip us when we were children, and rightly so. It's a lesson you'll remember for the rest of your life. The boy got angry and shouted out, Oh so, just try it. Well, I won't come to this shithole again. And so my mother persuades me, it's no good. Go and visit my grandmother and grandfather. I really need to be here and smell the manor. Boredom alone. It's fun in the city. Me and the guys in the garage having fun, listening to music. What's the big deal if I buy a beer? And then that nasty Rhonda comes snitching. Nellie clutched her heart. What beer, Granson? You're only 13 years old. You're too young. 
Who do you think you are? Grandpa doesn't drink much, only a little on holidays. Your mother is golden. She works two jobs to make sure you don't need anything. The teenager spat out angrily. I guess it's my daddy, who got me pregnant by my mommy. No one else. I'm going home tomorrow. I'm fed up with you righteous people. Alex never came to see them again after that. Molly came and complained that her son had no peace at all. He's going down the wrong road. He doesn't want to study at all. He's got straight A's. He got involved with bad company, started drinking and smoking. There were constant scandals at home. He was totally out of control. And that was it. Todd was angry, tried to call and talk to his grandson man to man, but he just waved him off. Grandpa, don't make a sound. Did your mother complain again? So we had a few drinks with the guys. What's the big deal? It's all right. All right. I don't have time. Come on, bye. He felt sorry for his daughter and could not help her. He could not get through to his grandson. Todd was getting gloomier and blacker, thinning, eating, and sleeping poorly. When they rushed and Molly took her father to the hospital for a checkup, it was too late. The doctors said the disease was in its final stages. Three months later, Todd was gone. Nellie had been with him until the last minute. He had died in her arms. He kept whispering to her with dried up lips. Forgive me for leaving you, Nellie, but my time has come. I've loved you and Molly all my life. Thank you for being there for me. But Alex, we missed him. We didn't see him coming. At his grandfather's funeral, Lesha was frowning, quiet, and depressed. He consoled his mother and grandmother, and like even picked up his mind a little, stopped his shenanigans. But not for long, soon it started again. It got to the point where Molly had to hide her purse from her own son. What good would that do? He was always trying to steal a couple of bills, and then he'd spend them on drinks or cigarettes, and they'd fight all over again. And then came that fatal tragedy that finally knocked Nellie down. Her only and beloved daughter, Molly, had died. It was so sudden and ridiculous. The woman was running home from a night duty, and right at the intersection she was hit to death by a drunk driver. The rascal fled at once, but precious time was lost, and while passersby called an ambulance, Molly died without regaining consciousness. This terrible news came over Nellie like a huge avalanche and she couldn't stand it, and went to the hospital after the funeral with her heart and blood pressure for a month. There was an investigation, then a trial. The scoundrel was found and put in jail, but Nellie didn't care. What difference did it make if no one was ever going to give Molly back to her? Over the past month, the woman had given up and grown old, crying day and night. Alex refused to go to his grandmother's village to live, and it was as if he had completely lost his mind. He had no respect for his grandmother and did not want to listen to her. He dreamed of getting rich quick and living like a major, not to deny himself anything. Soon he and three other accomplices were caught robbing a kiosk. That's how his grandson ended up in prison for five years. But even there he managed to do things, from gambling to asking for money or a parcel without end. Nellie, even though she knew Alex's soul was awful, still felt sorry for her grandson and supported him. She collected vegetables and fruit for him, traded little by little, and gave him parcels to send to the zone. She was going through her life and unnoticed she had finished painting the fence at the cemetery. But suddenly she heard a voice behind her. Excuse me, do you have anything to eat? At the cemetery they often bring food to the grave. In front of her stood a young lad in his twenties, almost like her grandson. He looked miserable. A tattered jacket, pants covered in dried mud, and sneakers with no shoes on. His head had not been washed or scratched in a long time. But his eyes, his eyes were so big and sad, like those of a beaten dog. He was ashamed to beg, and even stepped aside, expecting the woman to scold him or reproach him. But Nellie suddenly, though she did not expect it from herself, said, Oh, son, I have nothing with me, I'm sorry. Somehow I didn't think about it. Let's go to my place, and I'll feed you. I've got soup and pancakes, and I'll have lunch with you too. 
so you won't be bored. My name is Mrs. Nelly. What's yours? Don't be afraid of me. I won't tell you how to live your life. I have a terrible grandson myself. The guy looked at her with such gratitude and said, Thank you so much, Mrs. Nelly. My name is Perry. I just got out of jail myself, and I ain't gonna lie. But it wasn't my fault, honest. I took it on myself. I was a fool. And now I'm begging. I can't get a job with a criminal record. I don't have a place to live. So I wander around. I have to beg. It's a shame, though. Mrs. Nelly just shook her head, but did not get into the boy's soul because she knew what it was like when everyone asked what was going on. And you were so sick, you howled. Surprisingly, Boo Boo did not greet her guest angrily. Though she was usually not happy to see strangers, she barked a little for decency, and that was all. The old woman set the table and called her guest. Come and eat, Perry. Everything is ready. I don't have any special delicacies. I'm a lonely woman. I live a simple life. So, as they say, we are happy as we are rich. The boy ate the usual buckwheat soup as if he hadn't eaten in a week, then drank tea and pancakes with pleasure, all the while praising the treats. Then he suddenly suggested, Mrs. Nelly, would you like me to chop some wood for you? I see you have a lot of them lying around. Somehow I can thank you for a nice lunch. I do not remember when I ate liquid food. The woman was surprised, but agreed. I will be glad if you help. I can't get enough. And my neighbor, Gregor, I can't get enough. He's always busy. The boy got to work, but it was obvious that physically he was very sick. He kept coughing and sweating and pale, often panting. Mrs. Nelly guessed. Perry, you're sick, aren't you? You must have a fever. Let me feel your forehead, will you? Oh God, you're burning up. You go lie down in the hall on the bunk. I'm going to fetch Tiffany next door. She's a good girl. She's a paramedic in the district center. Let her take a look at you. And I, too, stupid head, made a sick man chop wood. The old woman ran and began to ask the young girl next door, Tiffany, baby, help. I took a vagrant in for dinner and he's sick it seems. He's burning up and coughing. Take a look at him with your experienced eye. Without further ado, Tiffany took her suitcase and ran, for it was her profession to help people. Tiffany looked at Perry, frowned for a long time, and then said, It looks very much like neglected bronchitis. We got to give her a course of antibiotics and vitamins right away, and we got to bring the fever down now. Otherwise, he might end up with pneumonia. Maybe we should put him on the ward and I'll arrange for one at the district center in a jiffy. Perry pleadingly protested. No, not the hospital. I just got out. I have no money for treatment. And then there would be questions. What's going on? I do not want it. I'll just leave quietly and that's it. Okay. Thank you for everything. And the boy started coughing again. Mrs. Nelly gave a wave of her hands. Where are you going, my dear? Stay down. I'll run down to the drugstore and Tiffany will give you a shot and a cure. Will you do it, Tiffany? The girl smiled. When have I ever said no to anything, Mrs. Nelly? You're like a mother to me. Besides, a man can't die without money, can he? We'll cure him, don't you worry. Now, Perry, why don't you get undressed and I'll rub you down and make a compress. That's the way to do it. Don't be so embarrassed. I'm practically a doctor. The boy couldn't take his eyes off this pretty blonde girl with such a sweet, husky voice and gentle, soft hands. He blushed and paled before her and could not say two words. And she, as if she hadn't noticed anything, would rub him with professional movements, give him injections, listen to him, and move an eyebrow. Perry was ready to be sick forever, just so she wouldn't go anywhere. After two weeks, the boy felt better. His cough was almost gone. He stayed with Mrs. Nelly, helping her with all her chores. The woman let him fix up the old outhouse and live in it. The lad was very grateful to her, for now he did not have to wander and beg. So he worked hard 
and tried in every way to do something good to this kind and sympathetic woman. He repaired the stove in the bathhouse, and now he stoked it regularly, and everyone there enjoyed the steam. Outwardly, the boy didn't look so gaunt either. Nellie cut his hair short, and he had his clothes washed and darned, washed and cleaned, and looked like a man. Tiffany visited them often, and they drank tea together and talked about other things. There was an invisible attraction between the two young men, as if they were attracted to each other. But they were just friends and socializing, nothing more. The girl helped Perry settle in, brought nice polka dot curtains and a tablecloth. Mrs. Nellie was only glad Perry was living with her. She was no longer lonely and lonely, after all, she had a living soul nearby. All the more so, Perry turned out to be a very modest and pleasant fellow, but very shy and not very talkative. He did not like to talk about the past, and Nellie did not ask him about it. But the neighbors gossiped on every corner and turned their heads. Nellie is out of her mind at her old age. Her own grandson was in jail, not enough for her. She had another criminal in her house. What's she thinking? Either he's going to kill her and rob her, or he's going to come into our garden. That criminal, who knows what's in his head. Tiffany alone understood and supported the elderly woman, but to the neighbors she was stupid too. They openly laughed at the poor orphan who had made a home in the village inherited from distant relatives and who went to work as a nurse in the district center. They could not understand why she went to help Nellie for nothing, writing letters to the blind woman's grandson in prison and running to get her pension at the post office. And now she has a habit of going to her after every shift, as if she had nothing else to do. Others at her age are enjoying life in the capital, especially the pretty girl, but this one is stuck in the countryside, messing around with a pensioner and a criminal. Tiffany really grew up in an orphanage. She still dreamed of family and comfort and never knew what that was. So she reached out to her neighbor because she was a kind, open, and sympathetic woman and treated Tiffany like her own daughter. She would listen to her, give her advice, and take pity. And she did like Perry a lot, but she kept her budding feelings to herself, hiding them in the farthest corner of her soul. The girl scolded herself. Stop thinking about him. He is a criminal, a tramp. What kind of a groom is he? And he's so secretive. He doesn't say anything about himself. He sighs and puts his eyes down. But it is clear from his eyes that he is a good man. His eyes are like a mirror. They never lie. Six months flew by unnoticed. In that time, Perry had literally transformed Mrs. Nellie's yard and house, repaired the porch and outhouse, cleaned the chimney, raised rabbits, and regularly mowed grass for them, making them for the winter. The woman became so attached to him that she felt as if he were her own grandson. Suddenly, one day, Boo Boo began to bark strongly and tear from the leash. Alex came into the yard. Mrs. Nellie shuddered, splashed her hands and tried to hug her dear man. Leshinka, my grandson, you are back. What a joy. Come on in. I'll set the table in a jiffy. Oh, how he changed. I did not recognize him. The woman looked at her grandson and really did not recognize him. Alex looked like a skinny, hard criminal with tattoos and some alien cold look. He reluctantly hugged her grandmother and sharply replied, Hey, Grandma. Well, not on vacation. What did you want? Well, come on, feed me. I'm so hungry. I decided to go back to my homeland to take a break for a while. Who's that by the porch? I don't understand. Mrs. Nellie came up to the young man and said, That's Perry, the lodger who lives in the outhouse and helps me around the house. You know it's hard for me now. I'm old and sick and tired of being sick and tired. Perry, this is my grandson, Alex. Here, he's decided to come home. Well, shall we go to lunch? Alex literally shot Perry an unkind look and didn't even shake his hand. But he averted his eyes and stepped back quietly. The grandson mumbled through gritted teeth. That's all I need to see here. What's the fashion to lure all kinds of trash to my place? From that day on, Mrs. Nellie's life was ruined. 
Her grandson did nothing but drink and drink all day long. He wouldn't help. And he wasn't in a hurry to get a job. He ignored Perry, and Perry tried to keep out of his sight. But Alex had liked Tiffany from his first day in the village. A shapely, blue-eyed blonde in her prime, and living alone. He was already mentally doing all sorts of things with her. And so one day he drank too much and brazenly showed up at the girl's house. She was just washing the laundry in the summer kitchen, and she even got frightened when she saw Mrs. Nellie's half-drunk, impudent grandson. She frankly disliked and feared him. He looked at her lewdly and cynically, then sat down on a chair, lay down imposingly, and began to intimidate her. Oh, you're beautiful, Tiffany. I like you. I could just eat you up. Would you like to go out, have a drink, have some fun? I haven't had a woman in prison in a long time. The girl was furious. She grabbed a heavy cast iron frying pan from the table and shouted, and get out of my house. The next time you come without asking or offer me such things, I'll go to the police. He'll punish you quickly. You'll go back to where you came from. Is that clear? Alex grinned unkindly and hissed. Well, the hell with you. I'm going. I don't want any trouble with the police. But just so you know, my grandmother will be dead soon, and you'll still be mine, and your house too. Just so you know. When Alex left, a terrified Tiffany sat down in her chair and cried because of the stress she had endured. She mentally compared that swaggering Alex and the quiet Perry, who seemed to be in jail too, but didn't look like a criminal at all, for crying out loud. But from that moment on, the girl kept an eye on her grandson, for she knew he was here for a reason and was obviously up to something. One day she was pulling weeds in the garden and suddenly she heard a voice. It was Alex talking on the phone in the backyard to someone in a high-pitched voice. The girl crept quietly, like a mouse, under the pear tree close to the fence and listened. The guy almost shouted, Yes, I know I took the deposit. I always keep my promises. Soon I will eliminate my grandmother, and she has no relatives except me. So the house and the plot will be yours, and build here whatever you want. I don't need this place for nothing. Yeah, I'll have it done by the end of the week. After all, I still have to get the poison. And they don't sell it on every corner, by the way. I know that's just my problem. All right. I'll see you later. Tiffany felt cold inside waited a while, and then went to Mrs. Nellie. She called her to her room on the pretext of taking her blood pressure. As soon as they entered the yard, she whispered, Listen, did some people come to see you recently? They wanted to buy a house. Remember, it is important. The old woman only waved her hand. Yes, these scoundrels have been courting me for six months. Three times they came from some company, I do not remember. They wanted to buy my house for a song and build a camping site in its place. It's almost in the woods. The place is fabulous here. The air is clean, the river is close by, and my land is beautiful, as you can see. Todd and I had four hands to work it, and now it's overgrown with weeds. Well, I don't want to sell a house. How can I sell a house? Where am I going? To town. And what have I forgotten there in my old age? This is where I was born. This is where I'll die. Well, what happened? Tiffany was shaking, and she began to tell me. What happened was, I overheard your grandson on the phone telling some people that he had already taken a deposit and you will eliminate by the end of the week. And he will sell your house. Do you realize you are in danger? What should we do? The old woman didn't believe her neighbor and waved her hands. What on earth are you talking about, Tiffany? Maybe you didn't hear it right. No, I don't. Alex isn't such a bad person. I mean, he's been a naughty boy since he was a kid, but to do something like that, that's just crazy. I don't even want to think about it. Come on, take your blood pressure. Should I take my pills today or not? But a worried Tiffany met with Perry and decided to consult with him. Perry listened to her attentively and became alarmed. This is no joke. I also noticed that Alex is watching the house, checking everything, 
as if he is preparing for something. Is he really going to kill his own grandmother? I couldn't let that happen. I'll be like a shadow on his trail, I promise. A few days later, Alex told my grandmother that he was leaving for work tomorrow and wanted to have a farewell party. He bought three bags of all kinds of delicious food and started setting the table himself. And he was surprisingly affectionate and friendly. Don't worry about me, Grandma. I bought everything ready to eat. Why stand at the stove? We'll have a drink. We'll have a snack. We'll sit and we'll bless the road for me, so to speak. Don't call anyone, just the two of us, like before. I've really let you down. It's no good. A surprised Mrs. Nelly fussed. Oh, I'll get some sauerkraut from the cellar and call Perry to the table, if that's the case. It's embarrassing, living in the same yard. It's so good, Alex, that you got a job, because I was beginning to worry. In fact, our heroine lurked behind the shed and began to look through a crevice. What will happen next? Her grandson's behavior was so unlike him that she suspected him of something bad. Alex had never spoken to her so affectionately in his life, and to spend an evening alone with her was out of the question. There was a catch all right. Mrs. Nelly saw her grandson take out some white powder in a vial from his sinus and sprinkle it generously over the food, not sparingly. At the same time, he was looking around in a vigilant fashion, watching and listening, lest anyone enter the kitchen. The old woman understood at once. Tiffany was right. Alex had really decided to poison her. Tears rolled down her wrinkled old cheek, and she thought to herself, so be it, so be it. If my own grandson doesn't even want me, then why live at all? She scooped some cabbage into a bowl, called out to Perry, and as if she hadn't seen anything, sat down at the table. The man came in, said hello to his granddaughter, and sat down at the table too. Alex poured the wine into shot glasses and said, there are no other dishes, so do not be offended. So shall we drink to my departure, to a new job and a new life? The grandson carefully moved their plate with a cutlet. You snack at once, grandmother, eat delicacies. And you, Perry, help yourself. The woman gathered her courage and took a bite mentally preparing herself for death. But suddenly Perry knocked the sausage out of her hands and shouted, don't eat anything. I'm begging you. He's poisoned everything in here. You bastard. How could you do this? It's your own grandmother. Don't you feel any pity for her? Alex's face twisted in an instant with hatred. And then he took a knife out of his pocket and went to Perry. Oh, you fucking rat. You think you're following me, don't you? What business is it of yours? Why are you sticking your nose in other people's business? I'll teach you a lesson. Mrs. Nelly screamed in a panic. What? Alex, you couldn't kill me. Come to your senses now. What are you doing? You're possessed, aren't you? Why are you so mean and cruel? Your mother and my grandfather and I loved you so much. What have I done to you? Tell me. The young man got very angry and started shouting. I need the money, do you understand? You were offered to sell the house, but no, you refused, and I agreed, okay. Why do you need such a huge house and land? And I already took the deposit, so there's no going back. And if it wasn't for that bastard, I would have had it all. A fierce scuffle broke out between the two men, Alex waving his knife around and shouting. I'll kill you, you bastard. It's all because of you, who invited you here in the first place. Perry yelled too. Don't you dare touch Mrs. Nelly. She's a holy woman. I won't let you kill her, understand. A frightened Mrs. Nelly ran for the police. Lucky for her, the police station was two houses away. By the time she got back with help, it was too late. Perry was bleeding and holding a knife sticking out of his side, and Alex was packing quickly. But even then, he remembered to turn out his grandmother's purse out of habit. The scoundrel was dragged away, and Perry was taken by ambulance to the district center, to the hospital. Devastated and discouraged, Mrs. Nelly sat on the edge of a chair, weeping bitterly, her face covered with her hands. My God, how could it be? 
Why did I have to go through all this? My own grandson wanted to poison me. And the main thing is, why? I loved him, pitied him, gave him my last. What's gonna happen to Perry now? The boy suffered for nothing. He wasn't afraid. He stood up for me. He wouldn't let me get killed. Perry's a real man. After her shift, Tiffany came running in, heard from the neighbors what had happened, and began to comfort the woman. Stop crying, Mrs. Nelly. Don't cry, I beg you. My heart is breaking. It's all over. We'll go and see Perry tomorrow. His wound is tangential. He'll be discharged soon. I called. I checked. But about Alex? Well, he was born that way. I guess there's nothing you can do about it. But you're not alone. I need you, and Perry's used to you. You'll be all right. Let's go and have some tea and raspberry jam. Have you got any more? Mrs. Nelly hugged the girl and thanked her sincerely. Thank you. Tiffany, you're no stranger to me, either. You're the only one who understands me. You don't leave me in trouble. You've got a good heart. You've got a responsive heart. Come on, honey. I'll make you some peppermint, just the way you like it. Mrs. Nelly was summoned to her office by the coroner, a scowling man named Mr. Robinson. He looked sternly at the woman, then began an unpleasant conversation. Good afternoon. I called on you, Mrs. Nelly, for one thing. Your grandson is going to jail for a long time for the attempt on that tramp's life, and there are other things that have been done to him. Will you sign the affidavit that Mr. Alex wanted to poison you, or have you decided not to? The woman wiped away a running tear and shook her head in the negative. No, comrade investigator, I will not. Let that remain on his conscience. Anyway, he is my own grandson, and I feel sorry for him. I still blame myself for not looking after him properly, for not being able to bring him up properly, to protect him from bad influences. I talked to Alex, and he said that he'd feel safer in jail, especially since the people from whom he took the deposit would be looking for him anyway. So be it. But I don't want to add to his sentence. Thanks, Perry, or I'd probably be dead by now. Mr. Robinson coughed and stared at the woman again. You make me wonder, Mrs. Nelly. Do you know who Mr. Perry is that you took him in out of pity? He's the man who ran over your daughter seven years ago. He did his time, and he just got out. Didn't you know who was living with you under the same roof? The woman became physically ill. She began to gulp for air and crawl down. She was losing consciousness. The frightened investigator did not expect such a reaction and realized he probably said the wrong words. He began splashing water on her from a jug, waving a handkerchief, and opened a window. The elderly woman slowly came to her senses and asked for water. Oh, I feel a little better. How could I, my dear, know that? After my daughter's funeral, I was in hospital for a month. I was not in court, and what for? No one could bring my daughter back. And about Perry. He told me he was in jail, but he told me he wasn't guilty. And I didn't ask too many questions. Jesus, what in the world is going on? No one, absolutely no one can be trusted. I felt so bad, as if someone had poured a slurry on me. Can I go now? It was probably better to die at the hands of her grandson than to find out that she had been feeding a murderer for so long. Oh, oh, oh. The woman could barely make it home. The yard was unfamiliarly quiet because she had gotten used to not being alone. Boo Boo joyfully twirled near the mistress, but she did not even look at the dog and went into the house. Thanks to Tiffany, who had cleaned up while Mrs. Nellie was out. The woman took Molly's portrait in her hands, kissed her eyes and cheeks again, and sobbed, Forgive me, dear. I didn't know who he was. I wouldn't have let you in the house. So disgusting, as if I betrayed you, my darling. But I won't have that scoundrel in my house again. I promise you that. But he seemed like such a quiet, honest, good guy. And he knew whose house the bastard lived in. He saw your portrait, and he didn't say a word. How two-faced people are. Mrs. Nelly had fallen into a deep depression and had fallen ill. The events of the past few days had completely undermined her, and she would not eat, nor get up, 
nor see anyone. Tiffany did not understand anything. She tried to make Mrs. Nelly talk. Tiffany thought she was so sad about her grandson and wanted to make her happy with the good news. Well, it's all right. Perry's coming back tomorrow. He'll be back, and you won't be so lonely again. He keeps asking how you are. Why don't you come and see him? How he feels you're not well. The woman suddenly covered her ears and sobbed so bitterly and doomfully. Don't talk to me about him. I hate him. He is a murderer. Do you understand? He's the one who killed my daughter. And he did time for it, the coroner told me. Perry will not be in my house. Tiffany was dumbfounded, stroking the old woman and trying to comfort her, and she herself was outraged. Barely waited for the next bus and rushed to the hospital. She raged, I'm going to kick his ass. What a bastard. He came to a man's house, even though he knew how much grief he had caused her. And to live quietly with her and take advantage of her ignorance and kindness. It's just awful. The angry girl entered the chamber like a fury and at once attacked the lad. It's true, answer me. Was it you who killed Mrs. Nellie's daughter and lived quietly in her house while you pretended to be a tramp? Why did you do it? Answer me. Perry sighed and answered. Why yes and no. Yes, I was indeed convicted of killing Miss Molly and I was in jail for five whole years. That's all true, but I didn't kill her. Do you understand me? I wasn't driving the car. Tiffany even opened her mouth because of this information. How can that be? You're lying again, aren't you? Stop trying to get out of line and tell the truth right now. He was getting angry little by little. I'm not lying. I was working as a driver for a businessman at the time. He was a big drinker and liked to go to bars. Though he was a model family man and a philanthropist in public. Well, that night he was driving, not me. But the businessman was afraid that all will be revealed. His wife knows about his nightlife and murder. So he decided to convince me to take the blame. The thing is, I was an orphan myself, raised by my aunt Susie. At the time she was diagnosed with cancer, she needed very expensive treatment. So the businessman, whose name was Mr. Hawkins, promised me that he would give me a lot of money to cure my aunt and leave me for my own apartment. He said he wouldn't give me many years because his lawyer would do his best. So I foolishly agreed. I didn't know what prison was. I thought I would serve three years and get out, but I would save my loved one and work as before and live in my apartment. But in reality, things turned out differently. They gave me five years spat in my face at the trial, shouted with hatred, bastard, murderer. That Mr. Hawkins was the first one to tell on me in every corner, cheated me, never gave me any money. My aunt found out what happened, she died. I never got a place to live. That's how I became a bum and a criminal with a murderer stigma. I didn't come to the cemetery for nothing. I wanted to repent, to tell Mrs. Nelia everything, but I couldn't. Would she have believed me? Tell me the truth. I can't believe I could be as stupid as I am. So I tried to help her in any way I could, thinking maybe later there would be a good time to tell her everything. Tiffany was stunned. She didn't know what to say. But one thing she was sure of. Perry, you've got to go and tell her everything. Just like you're telling me now. You should see the state Mrs. Nellie is in. She sobs and thinks you're a murderer and she curses and hates you. It ain't right. It isn't fair. The boy nodded his head. You're right, Tiffany. No more chickening out and burying your head in the sand. I've done enough stupid things in my life. It doesn't matter if she forgives me or not. As long as I tell the truth, I really can't live with it anymore. The next day, Perry left the hospital and he mustered all his courage and went to Mrs. Nellie's house. Boo Boo greeted him cheerfully, getting on her hind legs and dancing. He stroked her on the head and caressed her. Then he quietly entered the house. The old woman lay like that. She was turned against the wall, unresponsive to anything. Perry coughed and said quietly, I didn't kill your daughter, you hear. I wasn't driving. My boss talked me into taking the rap for him, promised me a mountain of gold, 
and to save my aunt from cancer. And I agreed. I did five years for nothing. But I was cruelly cheated, my aunt died, she never waited for expensive treatment, and I didn't see any money either. Now I'm a bum and a criminal, and a murderer, as everyone thinks. But I could swear on my Bible that I wasn't in that car that night. I wanted to tell you at the cemetery that night, to ease my soul. I can't live with it anymore. I chickened out. I know you won't believe me anyway. And I don't expect it. All right, I'm going. Goodbye. And thank you for your kindness and responsiveness. You are a very good man. The woman woke up, sat down on the bed, and told the guy, kneel down, over there, under the icons, and tell the truth. If you lie, God will punish you, don't doubt. The boy knelt down, crossed himself, and whispered quite calmly, I didn't kill anybody, I swear, I didn't hit your daughter that day. Mrs. Nelly exhaled, so it's all true, you're not lying. I believe it now. But why? Tell me, did you do it? What fools you young people are. You've made your fate all messed up. And now you're branded for life. And the one who killed him, where is he now? The guy stood up and answered sadly. You know him very well. He's a famous businessman, Mr. Hawkins, and he's already a deputy and he's living just fine. I was his driver at the time. There you go. What's there to say now? Who's got something to prove? It's your own fault. I signed everything voluntarily. All right. I'll leave you to it. There, I told you all about it, and I feel relieved. Nellie took Perry's hand. Don't go anywhere, my dear. Stay here. I'm so used to you. It hurt me so much, because you don't look like a murderer. That's all. I kept thinking. Well, could I be so wrong about a man? Let's live as before, and I don't care what people say in the village. Let them look after themselves and not pry into other people's lives. Oh, I'm even hungry. I ain't got nothing. Perry laughed and said, well, then I'll go do my chores like I used to. I've been in the hospital and my sides are aching. Thank you for believing me. I don't want to live when I think I'll have to wander the world again begging for alms. Nellie went to cook dinner. She was genuinely glad that Perry had had nothing to do with her daughter's murder, for she had really grown to love him as one of her own. She watched out the window as he deftly cleaned the rabbit cages and fed the animals, and she could see that he really enjoyed it. The man sometimes wrinkled his nose in pain, the wound not yet completely healed, but he worked with the animals long and to the best of his ability. Then they ate fried potatoes with onions and drank tea and jam, and they both felt so light and good, as if a huge slab of concrete had been removed from their hearts, which was pressing down and preventing them from breathing. Tiffany learned that Mrs. Nellie and Perry had reconciled, and he was living with her again, and she was very happy. Now they drank tea almost every night in the gazebo that Perry had renovated and restored, played with Boo Boo, and talked about everything. One day, when it was terribly hot, and the young people were helping a pensioner tie tomatoes, Mrs. Nellie suddenly suggested, Tiffany, take Perry down to the river, while it's hot, for a swim. Of course, he doesn't know how beautiful it is here. In the meantime, I'm going inside for a nap, too, for I'm tired. The youngsters decided to follow the advice, and Tiffany led Perry to the riverbank. It really was a beautiful place, wasn't it? The view was simply breathtaking. Forests, fields, and clear blue skies with feathery clouds. The girl undressed first and was left in her swimsuit. She splashed Perry with cool water. Well, what are you doing? Let's go swimming. The water's great. Let's swim to the other shore. There are beautiful lilies there. I'll show you. The locals say there are even mermaids here. But of course I laugh and don't believe in such fairy tales. Perry shuffled from foot to foot and finally admitted. You see, I just don't know how to swim at all. That's why I don't dare. When I was a kid, I went to the river with the boys. And they tried to drown me. As a joke. And I went down with a hatchet. They barely saved me. I've been afraid of water ever since. Tiffany didn't laugh at him. 
He was afraid of it more than anything else, but just took him by the hand. It's all right. So I'm going to teach you. Okay, first we go in waist deep. Now hold on to me and move your arms. He tried to repeat after her and admired her slender figure and such an open smile. How beautiful she was. Water droplets glistened on her skin and shimmered. The sun played in her blue eyes. Perry was finally getting the hang of it and he was able to swim quite a distance. Tiffany was genuinely happy and snuggled up to him, wanting to give him a friendly kiss on the cheek. But the boy suddenly pulled her to him and suddenly kissed her hard and passionately on the lips. It was so tender, sincere, and beautiful that the girl responded to the kiss. When they had caught their breath, Perry said softly, Tiffany, honey, I've liked you a lot since the first minute I saw you. I dreamed of being sick all the time, just to have you touch me just once more with your gentle hand. And now I am certain that I love you. I know I'm a terrible fiancé, of course. Why would you want an ex-con who everyone thinks is a murderer? But I would very much like to change my life. I really like farming, I'm even thinking about going into farming. I like living here in the countryside. The big city is not for me, but my biggest dream is to live my life together with you, as a family, to have children. If you don't want any of this, or if you don't love me, just say the word and I'll never bother you again. Everything inside Tiffany was jubilant and trembling. Here they were, the very cherished words she had waited so long for from Perry. For secretly, at night, she had dreamed of the same thing. Somehow, in her inner feminine way, she felt that Perry was her soulmate, that they were kindred, similar souls. And what about people? Let those people shut up. It was what she herself felt that mattered. Tiffany snuggled closer to the boy and said, that's what I wanted too, honestly. That's why I don't leave the village. I feel comfortable and safe here. After a shift in the district center, I rest my soul only here. And also, I like you very much too. Everyone can make mistakes. We are all not perfect. The main thing is to make a conclusion and go on. God is merciful. He forgives our sins. If a man sincerely repents and no longer repeats mistakes, and they jumped into the water together. And then they laughed, hugged each other, and basked in the cool, refreshing water. From that day on, Perry and Tiffany began a tumultuous and passionate romance. They married and became legally husband and wife. They all decided to live at Mrs. Nellie's house. There was plenty of room, and the yard was spacious. Perry decided to put his idea into practice, built up a barn, and began to raise rabbits in large numbers at first, because it didn't require much of an investment. The neighbors only laughed at him, because no one had ever become rich by selling rabbits before. But the guy listened to no one, went to exhibitions, bought special breeds, crossed, bred valuable offspring, and already with his pets he went to exhibitions. It went well, and the farm began to buy young stock from him. At the same time, Perry mastered beekeeping. He had loved this business since childhood, one might say, it was his dream. And in three years he has raised more than a hundred hives, took them out into the field. The honey was especially valuable, motley grass. People were now going to them specifically for propolis and royal jelly. After all, it is very valuable in medicine and cosmetology. Now no one made fun of the former criminal. The man was respected in the village, his house was exemplary and his wife was the most beautiful. The family had a daughter, Hannah, who was as charming and chubby as her mother. Mrs. Nellie was happy for the young family, of which she was now a part, and enjoyed babysitting her granddaughter, and often thought, what a blessing it was that I called Perry in, that I didn't turn him away, for he was such a golden boy. Not like Alex. Oh, my Alex, it was his next term and he seldom wrote letters to Grandma. He thought prison was his home, and he couldn't resist temptation on the outside. Mrs. Nellie quietly went to a notary and wrote a will, leaving the house to Perry when she died. It was not an easy decision, but she was sure that the man would not lose, would not sell his native land for next to nothing, but would live and work on it. 
She still didn't forget Alex, even though he wanted to poison her, and she still sent him packages whenever possible. But, alas, she could not change her grandson. The boomerang of fate struck Mr. Hawkins, both deputy and businessman. He crashed in an accident while still driving drunk, and he was confined to a wheelchair for life. His business went bust, his competitors immediately stole his tidbits, and his parliamentary career was now out of the question as well. His wife found out about his many affairs and mistresses, divorced the scoundrel, sued him for his three children for almost everything, and sent Hawkins himself to a nursing home for the disabled. Mr. Perry was told all this by a customer who had come from the capital. The man was shocked and decided to share the news with Mrs. Nelly. She only shook her head. So my prayers have reached God. God's judgment is complete. Everyone is given according to his deeds. Don't dig a hole for another, or you'll fall in it yourself. Serves that scoundrel right. He ruined your daughter. He ruined your fate. Let him feel what it's like to have everyone turn their backs on you. And you're an invalid. Soon Tiffany was pregnant again, and she laughed jokingly. Perry, stop. You won't let me get out of maternity at all. And that's how they joke in the maternity ward. When do you expect to get your third? The man held his beloved close to him and whispered, I promise, three and all. I dreamed so much about it, a big family, a beloved wife, and long-awaited children. Thank you, dear, for believing me then, taking a risk, and tying your life to me. It was Mrs. Nellie's love for you and kindness that gave me the motivation to change, to start over, to live my life differently. And if it hadn't been for you, where would I be now? Like Alex in jail, or dead under a fence somewhere from starvation or disease. I want you to know that I love you more than life. Tiffany literally melted at these words and answered, I am very fortunate to have the best husband in the world, father of a child, family man, and master of the house. And all this is you, my good man. I love you too, and I will be there for you, no matter what happens. In time, everyone forgot that Perry had once been in jail, because now he was a respected farmer and beekeeper, Mr. Perry. So everyone can change their lives. The main thing is a sincere desire and responsive people around you.